to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Every week on Science Fantastic, we profile the amazing, jaw-dropping, scientific discoveries which are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives. And today, well, I get a lot of emails, so instead of answering each one, I'm going to answer them collectively. I'm going to select some of the best questions that I get about the coronavirus, perhaps the epidemic of the century, and we'll talk about the science, the science behind the coronavirus pandemic. Well, today, as I said before, I'm going to collectively answer a lot of the emails I get about the coronavirus, the science behind the coronavirus. So today, we're going to talk about questions like, where did it come from? Was it engineered? Is it really as dangerous or more dangerous than the flu? What are we going to do about it? And why were all the models incorrect? And so we'll try to tackle all these questions one by one. Well, first of all, let me say that I do not have a Ph.D. in biotechnology. If you have a question about symptoms and about therapeutics and care for the coronavirus, then consult your physician. However, I do have a Ph.D. in theoretical physics. And modeling, computer modeling is the way we analyze the coronavirus. And computer modeling was pretty much invented by physicists. We've been using computer modeling for many decades to model the behavior of the atmosphere, rockets, outer space, gas clouds, supersonic flight. We've been using computer modeling for decades, and now we're using it for the epidemiology of the computer of the coronavirus. Well, here's a question that I get, and that is, where did it come from anyway, this virus, which is infecting millions of people around the world? This, of course, is a question being debated by governments, nations accusing other nations in terms of allowing the virus to spread. Well, first of all, we have to realize that about 60% of all diseases originally come from animals. That's right, animals. In fact, animals are older than humans. They've been around much longer. But when we trespass on their territory, their breeding ground, sometimes, sometimes they mutate and jump over from infecting animals to infecting humans. For example, take a look at the Black Plague. The Black Plague killed about 50% of the population of Europe, not once, but on several occasions. And the Black Plague, we think, was spread by fleas that infected rodents. More recently, take a look at the Hantavirus, which infected Native Americans in the American Southwest. That was spread by an animal that looks very much like a prairie dog. And Look at the flu. Yes, when we look at the flu, we have genetically sequenced all the genes of the flu. And what do we find? Bird DNA and pig DNA inside the DNA of the flu. And why is that? Well, first of all, why do we have the Asian flu, the Shanghai flu, the Hong Kong flu, the Beijing flu? A lot of these flus originate not just in China, but throughout Asia. And why is that? There's something called polyfarming. Polyfarming is when farmers live in very close proximity to aquatic birds like ducks and pigs. Well, the pigs eat the bird droppings. We eat the pigs. And the pigs act as a mixing bowl, a mixing bowl for bird DNA, pig DNA, and even human DNA. And that's one of the reasons why we have the flu, because the flu comes from aquatic birds and pigs. And so you have to realize that this means that we're going to have another pandemic. We don't know when, but because we are trespassing on the ancient grounds of these viruses, it's inevitable. For example, take a look at HIV. When you sequence the genes of HIV, AIDS, the AIDS virus, you find that it's pretty much identical to the SIV version, the simian version that infects chimpanzees. And so we think that 
a virus that infected chimpanzees for generations, perhaps even thousands and millions of years, one day mutated, hopped over to infect humans. And so that's what we think it came from. And then the next question is, the question that a lot of governments would like to know the answer to is, was it engineered? Did somebody deliberately create this virus? Well, we've sequenced the virus genes. We find that about 96% of its genes are identical to a horseshoe bat. Now, the story goes that the horseshoe bat was traded at the wet markets in Hunan province in China. This, this is a market for exotic animals. And then it hopped over to humans. Well, there's a problem with that. And the problem is there were no horseshoe bats at the Hunan wet market. Yes, there were exotic animals there, but they don't deal with horseshoe bats. And so we have a question mark. Then where did it come from? Well, in a worst case scenario, maybe it was weaponized. Well, the genes have been sequenced, and what we find is the following. First of all, why does the virus look like a corona, like the corona of the sun, which surrounds the sun? These are called spike proteins. And these spike proteins, which jet out of the surface of the virus, latch on to your cell. Your cells in your lung have what is called a docking site. A docking site where valuable organic minerals and, and uh, compounds are then harvested by your cell. But the coronavirus latches on to the ACE2 docking site of your cell and then opens it up. There's one gene that latches on to the ACE2 gene. Another set of genes, like a can opener, opens up the surface of your cell, allowing the virus to inject its RNA into your cells. Then it makes thousands of copies of itself, which then burst out, and eventually you get sick. And some people die as a consequence. Well, a weapon here, somebody that deliberately tries to weaponize a virus, usually takes a known virus and tinkers with it. A little change here, a little change there. But this virus is different. Lots of novel mutations. Things that a weapon here would never do. Things that require a leap in our understanding of the genetics. And that's why we think that perhaps it was a byproduct of evolution. But then, did it escape from a laboratory? Well, we'll talk about that after the break. with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, I'm going to answer a lot of the emails that I get about the coronavirus. Now, once again, I'm not a doctor. I do not have a PhD in biotechnology, but I do have a PhD in theoretical physics. And that's where computer modeling comes from. We physicists were the first ones to apply computers to model the behavior of storms, the weather, rockets, planets, celestial objects in space, black holes. All of that comes from the world of physics. And today, we're going to talk about the coronavirus. Well, when we last left off, we were talking about whether it was deliberately engineered or whether it escaped from a laboratory. First of all, neither can be conclusively ruled out. It's always possible that a weaponeer could have created these novel genetic mutations, but it's unlikely. They're quite novel. They're not simply tweaking the SARS virus, for example. No, it's a rather radical departure from what, how you would weaponize a virus. But then the next question is, did it escape from a laboratory? Well, that is definitely possible, given the fact that the horseshoe bat, which is the source of over 96% of the genes of the coronavirus, the fact that the Hunan wet markets did not deal with horseshoe bats. So where did the horseshoe bat come from? 
if it didn't come from the wet markets in Hunan province? Well, there are two institutes of virology right there in Hunan, which is rather coincidental. We're talking about the epicenter of the virus and the fact that we have not one, but two high-level virology institutes, one at bio-level safety level four and one at level two. And there was even a notice posted on the web since taken down months ago saying that, well, perhaps something escaped from our laboratory. Well, did it escape? It's possible. It cannot be ruled out. In fact, we need more information. Unfortunately, the Chinese government has not been forthright in opening up their files. For example, we don't have samples samples of the virus that they were tinkering with uh, back then in November and December of last year. So it's a big question mark. Some people say, no, it probably did not escape. It was probably a byproduct of evolution. But you can't rule out the fact that perhaps there were experiments being done on the horseshoe bat at either of these two virology institutes right outside the city of Hunan, which coincidentally is the epicenter of the pandemic. Next question I get in the email is, what's all this fuss about the virus, the coronavirus, the flu? Isn't the flu just as dangerous? Well, we can actually quantify a little bit the answer to that question. How dangerous is the coronavirus with respect to the flu. First of all, the fatality rate. The fatality rate of the ordinary flu is about 0.1%. So 0.1% of people who come down with the flu eventually die of it. Now, what percent is comparable to the coronavirus? It turns out that number has been changing. Recent studies done in New York, where I live, also in Santa Clara County, Los Angeles, and California, indicate that it's not as fatal as previously thought. However, its fatality rate is, we think, somewhere between 0.5% and 1%. In other words, it is still 5 to 10 times more lethal than the flu. But you see, there are two numbers you have to put in your equation. Not one, two numbers. The other number is how contagious is this virus? If this virus is not contagious at all, then the fatality rate is totally irrelevant. If the fatality rate is very low, but the contagious contagion rate is very high, then you're in trouble. So let's take a look at that. Are not is the contagion index. For the flu, it is 1.3, meaning that if you are infected with the flu, on average, you will infect 1.3 other people. So that's where R0 comes in. R0 for the flu is 1.3. If it were 1, you would reach a steady state. So one person infects one person. What is the R0 for the coronavirus? Well, that's still being debated, but we think it's somewhere between 5 and 6. So in other words, it is exponentially more contagious than the flu. Its R0 is 5 to 6 times greater than the R0 of the flu. So in summary, what does it mean? It means that, well, first of all, yes, the flu does kill thousands of people. No doubt about that. But the coronavirus is five to ten times more lethal, even with the new data coming in. And it's also five to six times more contagious. Well, then the next question is, why did people underestimate how dangerous this virus was? Back in January, we got indications from China that it was simply not that dangerous a virus. It doesn't really go from animals to humans. Now we realize that it's incredibly contagious. So what went wrong with the computer models? Well, computer models are actually quite good when you put in the inputs. However, there's a huge variable, and that is human behavior. 
it is almost impossible to quantify what humans will do in a crisis. And that's why some of these numbers are all over the place. So let's analyze the numbers carefully. Let's say, first of all, you do nothing. That's right, nothing. You just let it rip. You just let the virus infect everybody. Everybody goes out and plays, shakes hands, kisses people, whatever. If you do nothing, then because the fatality rate is between, well, let's say 1%, it means that approximately 3 million Americans will die. So that's the upper limit. That's where that number comes from. So if you just let the virus rip and do nothing, you have what is called herd immunity. Eventually, some people become immune to the disease, but at a price of, well, 1% of the population will die, about 3 million people. Now let's do the opposite. Let's assume that you have 100% perfect social distancing. Everybody takes precautions and the virus is stopped in its tracks. Then what is the death toll after three weeks? The answer is zero. Because the virus has to spread from one generation to the next or else it dies. It dies because either you get well or you die. So in other words, we can have computer models that are anywhere from zero to three million. So how do you choose the best model? You have to model human behavior. And that is the sticking point. That's the reason why some of these models are all over the place. Because people have a different assessment of how effective social distancing is. And that's why you cannot computerize human behavior. And so the problem with the computer models is not the computer model. The computer is fine. The problem is us. We are the ones who are the wild card. And that's why it's so difficult to get computer modeling somewhere between zero deaths and three million deaths. Then the next question is, well, some people look at Sweden and they say, look, Sweden has no lockdown, hardly at all. It has a little bit of social distancing, but for the most part, things are quite normal in Sweden. So maybe we can do the same. Maybe we can just let it rip, just like in Sweden, and that's it. Well, when you start to analyze Sweden more carefully, you realize that there are problems. First of all, Sweden, like most Scandinavian countries, have a very low population and low tourism rate. I mean, how many times do you want to take a vacation? And instead of going to Paris, you wind up in Sweden. Not too often. And that's the reason why tourists are not bringing the virus so much to Sweden. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, I'm going to answer a lot of the emails that I get concerning the coronavirus, the science of the coronavirus. And once again, if you think you have symptoms of the coronavirus, consult your doctor. I am not a doctor. I have a PhD in theoretical physics, not in biotechnology. So we are going to talk about computer modeling and what is known about the coronavirus. Well, first of all, as I said, some people look at Sweden. Sweden is a country that has only a moderate locking down of its citizens. Uh, social distancing is practiced, but the economy is going full blast. And it has a, you know, it's, it survives. It, it does well. And the question is, why can't we follow the example of Sweden? Well, first of all, Sweden has a very small population and a small tourist industry. People do not naturally think of going to Sweden on a holiday. And tourism is one of the main ways in which the coronavirus has spread. It spreads at the speed of a jet airplane. And so we have to realize that, yes, Sweden also pays a price. Its death rate is six times higher than the death rate for Norway and other Scandinavian countries. 
So in other words, they made a deal with the devil. They decided that, yes, they're not going to lock down their economy, but they're willing to pay the price. And that is a death rate, mainly among seniors, six times higher than the death rate in other Scandinavian countries. So then the question is, if you follow the Swedish model, it turns out the computer modeling is relatively good at predicting the death rate. And the question is, are you willing to tolerate that amount of death? Then the, a better comparison is with South Korea. When you take a look at South Korea, you find that it has a relatively low death rate. And same thing with Singapore until very recently. And then the question is, why? And the answer is the SARS virus. The SARS virus hit South Korea, Singapore, and other Asian nations really hard. And as a consequence, they set up an early warning system. They set up protocols. They set up procedures. They ordered equipment. So they were prepared for the next SARS virus. And that's why in South Korea, as soon, as soon as they got wind from China that there was something dangerous about this virus, they clamped down. And they started to do contact tracing immediately. And sure enough, it turns out that they found the hotspot, which they immediately were able to quarantine. The hotspot was in a religious sect in South Korea. And so that's an example of where social distancing and locking down actually worked. In fact, it worked so well that they even infringed upon the privacy of individuals. This perhaps is a technique that may not be tolerated in the United States, but they use cell phone activity to plot your network of friends, where you're going. If there's a super spreader in your community, it alerts you and will try to even quarantine you if you turned out to be a super spreader of the virus. So it's not clear whether in the United States we would tolerate that much invasion of privacy but, well, the South Korean people have voted, and yes, the virus is spreading in South Korea, but at a very low rate. And then another question I get is, this six feet distance we have to have between uh, people, is that effective? Is that the way to go? to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, I'm going to answer some of your questions about the science behind the coronavirus. And I'll take questions one by one. Another question I get is this six-foot distance that we have to spread between individuals. How effective is that? Well, time and again, scientists have underestimated how lethal and contagious this virus is. And there's a debate among scientists about that six-foot distance. First of all, when you sneeze, a lot of the droplets fall to the floor within around six feet. So unless you sneeze in the air, high up, high up over people's head, unless you do that, for the most part, the water droplets fall to the ground uh, within a radius of about six feet. However, here's the question. What about aerosols? If I have perfume and I shoot perfume in a room, let's say a closed room, the perfume will be smelled pretty much everywhere in that room, far beyond six feet. These are aerosols. Aerosols are tiny droplets suspended in air that could be the size of a blood cell, for example. They could be that small. And it turns out that, yes, the coronavirus can indeed spread by aerosols, but not by much. When you go to a hospital in China where there was a rampant amount of coronavirus and you analyze the air outside the hotel room, scientists were shocked to find that, yes, you could find evidence of the coronavirus outside the room of somebody who was infected by the virus. Now, that doesn't mean that these virus particles were active. Maybe they were inactive and dead. We don't know. All we know is that, yes, the virus can, in principle, spread beyond six feet. And you should also, when you meet people, keep a distance. 
but also don't talk to them for too long. The longer you are exposed to somebody with the virus, the higher the chances you will come down. In fact, I saw one recommendation that 15 minutes, you really should not spend any more than about 15 minutes in the company of other individuals. And again, look at the data. There was one case in Korea where there was a bridge club and one woman infected the entire bridge club. Well, scientists know the position where everyone sat in that bridge club uh, game. They know the distance, and they pretty much reconstructed what happened at that bridge game, and they found out that she infected people as far away as 15 feet. So in other words, yes, three feet is a ballpark figure, but if you can, I would distance yourself even farther than just six feet. Then the next is therapeutics. What happens if we don't get a virus, uh, get, don't get a vaccine soon? We'll have to rely on therapeutics. Now, if I had a chance, if I had a chance to choose the therapeutics that I could get, I would choose the following. I would choose one, antibody plasma therapy. This has been known for 100 years, ever since the flu epidemic of 1918. You basically take the blood of somebody who survived the epidemic and has antibodies built up in their blood to fight the virus. You extract out the plasma from the blood and then inject the plasma into somebody who's suffering from the coronavirus. And it works. It's not a cure. It will reduce the severity of symptoms. But hey, it's better than dying. Now, the second therapeutic, which is actually being recommended by the FDA, is remdesivir. Remdesivir is an antiviral. It was actually perfected against the Ebola virus and turned out to be only moderately useful against the Ebola virus. And it's been sitting on a shelf for many years, and they tried it against the coronavirus, and it does shorten the days you are on a ventilator, from 15 days to 11 days. Now, you may say to yourself, that's not much. No, it is a lot, because once you're on the ventilator, every day you're on the ventilator, every day you increase the chance of dying. And what is the chance of dying on a ventilator? About 90%, I repeat, about 90% of those people put on ventilators eventually die. And that's why remdesivir could be a life-saving therapeutic if you are suffering from the virus. To Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, I'm taking your questions, your questions about the coronavirus. And once again, if you think you have symptoms of the coronavirus, then of course, call your physician. I am not a doctor, but I am a PhD in theoretical physics, and we're the ones who pretty much invented computer modeling. Well, as I mentioned, there are several therapeutics which are not cures, but which show enormous promise in the hospitals. First is the antibody plasma therapy, where you inject uh, the plasma extracted from the blood of previous patients who had the virus and survived and have antibodies in their blood that can fight off the coronavirus. That technique is 100 years old. Then there's remdesivir, which is an antiviral actually perfected against the Ebola virus, which turned out to be only moderately successful, but it does short the time that you are on a ventilator, and that could save your life. And the third therapeutic that is much more speculative is BCG. It turns out that BCG is used against tuberculosis, which is caused by a bacterium, not a virus at all. But for reasons we don't understand, BCG seems to work for other viruses. Now, that's not the way it was supposed to be, but you cannot argue with results. 
And in Asia, for example, tuberculosis was more common, so a whole generation of Asians have already been, been inoculated by BCG, but not in the United States, because tuberculosis is not such a widespread problem in the United States. So that's another therapeutics. And as time goes by, well, 50 therapeutics are being analyzed right now, and perhaps we'll have more lines of defense. Then the next question is, what about a vaccine? Well, sometimes vaccines don't work. That's kind of a horrible thought, but take a look at AIDS and the HIV virus. It's been decades since the, earth, since the world was ravaged by HIV, and we still, even today, after millions of dollars being spent, we do not have a vaccine against HIV. And why is that? HIV mutates too quickly. It is a retrovirus. Its air control of its DNA process and RNA is actually rather faulty, and it makes constant mutations. It's like a moving target. Every time you prepare a vaccine for one version of the HIV, another version pops up, and you've got to start all over again. Now, the good news is, the good news is the coronavirus does not mutate at the same rate as HIV. That was a tremendous relief because if this, the coronavirus did change with every generation, then it means that it would be incurable with a vaccine just like HIV. Now, of course, the coronavirus does mutate, but the mutations are minor. And we think that one vaccine could knock out all the variations that we've seen so far. Well, then the next question is, what's taking them so long? If a vaccine has already been perfected, we already have them in the laboratory, why don't we simply use them? Well, there are at least three reasons why we don't have a vaccine in your neighborhood hospital. First of all, we have to test that it works. Second of all, we have to test for side effects. And third, we have to test for the fact that it works for everybody and not just one race, one ethnic group, one sex, or whatever. Let me give, let me give you a counterexample. Thalidomide was advertised as this wonder drug decades ago. It was widely prescribed, but then it turned out that thalidomide caused horrible birth defects. Children were born without arms or legs. They were disfigured. Why? Because thalidomide, we didn't test it for its side effects. And therefore, we have to be very careful. If we have a vaccine and we inoculate billions of people with it, and then we find out, oops, it has a side effect causing, let's say, birth defects in pregnant women, then we've made a huge mistake. We basically doom millions of people with birth defects. So we don't want to duplicate the lesson with thalidomide, so that means we have to test. And that, of course, takes time. And then another question I get is, what about the future? First of all, we're going to have to prepare for another pandemic because it's inevitable. Pandemics come from animals, and we live with animals. In fact, we trespass on their ancient hunting grounds, and sometimes they mutate, jump over, and cause the next pandemic. But how will it affect society? Take a look at the World War II generation. They went through the Great Depression. They went through World War II. And that generation turned out to be very resilient, very hardy, but very conservative socially, very mindful of their money, very careful because of the enormous shock of the Great Depression and World War II. But then the children of that generation went berserk because they were the Vietnam War generation. And they violated all the social norms of their parents. And the next generation, well, you could call them the 9-11 generation. And the 9-11 generation is much more cautious about personal security. For example, getting on an airplane, we don't mind the fact that we have to wait in these lines to get on the airplane because, hey, better to wait than be blown up in uh, off the ground once your airplane takes off with a bomb on it. And so we live with that. 
And so we're going to have to live with certain restrictions from the coronavirus. In other words, we won't be able to shake hands, we won't be able to kiss each other on the cheeks, and what other social norms are going to be changed with the next generation? 